Hey everyone, welcome back to Tier and Apologetics. Super pumped to be joining us today. Today I have Rob Coons. We're going to be talking about the Trinity and his specific work where he tries to defend like a strong version of divine simplicity and explain like the idea of God being triune at the same time. So super fun. Rob, thank you. How are you doing today? Great. Great, Zach. How are you? Good. I'm super pumped for this conversation where we're going to be diving into like the Trinity and like your model, one of your models of the Trinity. Um, is there anything you want to say on this topic, Rob, before we dive into the questions for today? Yeah, I'm glad you said model, because I think that's the right way to think about it. Um, so, you know, beyond, well, I'm not pr proposing this as, as doctrine, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not proposing this is what we believe. But, but the, you know, the questions, there are two questions, right? One question is, is the doctrine of Trinity logically coherent, consistent, right? And secondly, is it consistent with a strong doctrine of divine simplicity? And I think the answer is yes, And but all you need to do in order to show that is to create a model of the Trinity that's consistent with the doctrine and consistent with divine simplicity, right? Whether it's true or not, doesn't matter in a sense, but it, that is, that's enough to establish the logical point that I'm going to establish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate your point of trying to say like, hey, we have this idea of like God being triune, super important to like Christian theology, um, yeah. and also like trying to defend like divine simplicity, which seems to be something super prominent in like Christian tradition and things like that. So right. yeah, I'm super pumped. So maybe to start off then, like what is the doctrine of the Trinity? Like when we're looking at like trying to defend God as triune, what is it like, what are we trying to defend here as Christians? Right. Yes. Well, of course, it's simple statement is that there's one God and three divine persons. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the question is how to, how to make sense of that. Um, typically, of course, I think one thing that's crucial is I think no one thinks, almost no one thinks, <laughs> that the three persons are, are three parts of God, as though you could sort of split God up into thirds and each one would be a distinct person. Uh, so that that's sort of out, right? And in some ways, at this point, it's maybe best to run through some of the heresies, right? <laughs> so uh, so we want to avoid tritheism. We want to avoid any kind of suggestion that there are three gods, right? Uh, at the same time, on the opposite side, there's a there's a fallacy called or a heresy called modalism, which I also try to avoid. And this was a bit harder for me to avoid, actually, in this model. And that's the idea that there's one God, but that we under, we understand God in three ways, where there's three aspects of God as he presents himself to us. So maybe mm -hmm. creator, redeemer, or sanctifier, or something like that. Uh, and that, um, at least as an account of the three persons, is not adequate. Uh, we want to say that the that God is three personal in himself or themselves in in the godhead it's not just in relationship to us or to the creation it's not something contingent or extrinsic about god but somehow intrinsic that he's three personal okay so then when we're looking at like the na nature of the persons of the trinity what we're trying to find then dr coons this idea that like well we have um three distinct persons um that are maybe like personal beings in like some respect is that trying to what you're trying to get at like there's some like distinct personality yeah. to each of them well, yeah, it depends what you mean by personality, but in the sense that each one is a person and they're distinct from the other two, right? Mm -hmm. So that there can be real interpersonal relationships within the Godhead. Mm -hmm. um, that, I think that's the crucial thing. Love, communication are going on interpersonally in God, even apart from the creation. That's, it, that's why it's a significant doctrine, I think, because if you thought if you had a purely Unitarian conception of God, then God would have to create things in order to love anything mm. or in order to communicate anything, right? Because he'd, he'd just be a single solitary person in and of himself. Yeah. I remember I had a discussion with one of my Jewish friends and yeah, he admitted that was a potentially a problem, right? They had to say that God is in his essence, potentially loving, has a disposition to love, but he isn't really love as such. And I think a mm -hmm. Christian could say that, that love is essential. Actu the actuality of love is essential to God. Yeah, that's super helpful. So thank you for bringing up Dr. Coons. So maybe then it'd be helpful to look at this idea of like a strong version of divine simplicity. So like what is divine simplicity and like what's a strong version of it that you're trying to defend like here in this, yeah. this kind of uh, paper? Good. So again, I mean, most all Christians will agree that God is simple in some sense. I think most most Christians will say that God doesn't have any moving parts, so to speak, right? That uh, you can't uh, kind of break God up into, into sub components of any kind. But the strong doctrine goes goes further than that, um, mm -hmm. at least at least in two ways. One is to say that God doesn't have a nature. God is a nature, is his nature. Mm -hmm. So in all other things, all created things, there's a distinction between the nature of that thing and the thing itself. Um, and only in God is, is that, are those the same. And then even further, um, this is the Thomas Aquinas' idea, also in Avicenna, actually, the, Muslim thinker, uh, that God is identical to his own existence. Mm 
So his, his very active existence of existing is identical to God. So, um, so that, that actually won't be terribly relevant to what we're talking about. The most, most relevant thing is the idea that God and his, is, is his nature as opposed to having a nature. So again, you know, if, if something has a nature, so I, I, I have the nature of being human and if there's even a particular human nature you might say that I have that makes me human, just as you, Zach, have your own human nature makes you human. But, you know, I'm not that nature, right? That nature acts on my matter and produces a human being, and that's me, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so my nature is involved in my being, what I am, but it isn't me. Uh, in, in the case of God, and actually angels to some extent, uh, you know, the, the essence or the nature is the being itself. There's nothing that the nature has to act upon to make something exist or to qualify something in any way. It just, mm. it just is, so to speak. Mm. So then we're getting to this idea of like trying to defend divine simplicity. Then we're going to have like have some sort of view where it's not like, oh, like, um, like the father's like one part and the son's one part and like the Holy Spirit's another part. Like, it's, like that's right. not going to kind of do for like your kind of version of like the Trinity. Right. And it's even harder in the sense, because um, if you thought that um, uh, this is, for example, the view that Michael Ray has proposed, that there are three properties here, the property of being fatherly, the property of being sonish and the property of being spirit or spiritual or something like that. And that these are three different sort of sub natures or additional, additional qualities that God has, yeah. right? Uh, mm -hmm. That's not going to work because uh, yeah. God, God just is a single nature, right? He can't mm -hmm. have any accidents is the way uh, we put it yeah. in, in, in scholastic philosophy. There is, there aren't any additional intrinsic properties over and above his nature that he can have. Mm. Yeah, that's super cool. And thank you for, um, as we dive into this. So it seems like to me, like we have this like question of like, how can we have like this idea of like three distinct persons um, that each are like, maybe like have their own like personality or I don't want to go too far and say like conscious, but like, like, like there's something distinct about being the father, something distinct about being the son, something right. distinct about being the spirit. We also yeah. want to hold to like divine simplicity, like where every part of God is identical to God. Um, and we right. kind of come to in this paper here is this idea that like the divine nature is going to have to be relational um, to make sense of the Trinity. So can you just like kind of flesh out, like what does that mean for it to need to be relational and how is that going to make sense of like explaining the yeah. Trinity? Yeah, good, good. So, right. So um, I think God may be unique in this respect in that his okay. nature, their nature is, is a certain kind of relation. Mm -hmm. So, so what it is to be God is to know and, and to love and to will and, yeah. and, Again, the, the classic picture is that those three relations are actually the same relation in God. So in mm -hmm. you and me, loving and knowing and willing are different things. In God, they're all the same thing. But in each case, it's a relation, right? Somebody willing something, somebody knowing something, somebody loving someone or something. So mm -hmm. it's what in, in logic we call a binary relation. Right? It has a, it has a, a subject and a patient, a, a, a subject and an object, basically, in this case. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and the claim here of, of divine simplicity is that that binary relation is the divine nature and that therefore is God. God is a kind of relation in a sense. Mm -hmm. Now, how does that get us to the Trinity? Well, um, part of what I'm doing is pretty traditional, actually. It's building on some ideas in Augustine and, and Aquinas where, uh, where they suggest that, um, that in, in making sense of the father and the son, that we can think of the father as the sort of thinker and the son as the thought, uh, mm -hmm. as the, the word, so to speak, that's, that articulates the, the father's thinking. And so I take that to mean something like this, that we can distinguish between God qua knower and God qua known, qua object of knowing, which is also the same thing as God qua lover and God qua beloved. Um, so, uh, so this qua language, right? I mean, that's just Latin for mm -hmm. as, so we could say father as lover and knower and, and God as, um, known and beloved, right? Um, it's, uh, it's a notion that has been, it's been around in philosophy forever. <laughs> you, you find it in Plato and Aristotle already. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's also been showing up a lot in recent, um, philosophy of language actually. So people working yeah. in formal semantics have kind of including one of my former colleagues, Nicholas Asher, who's in France now, uh, uh, has really developed the kind of logic of this. So, so did Kit Fine. So it's a, it's got some very ancient roots, got some very contemporary work mm -hmm. that's going on in there. Yeah. So part of the idea of the book was paper was to, you know, trying to apply this to, to God in particular. Yeah. Um, now the spirit's a bit trickier, right? Cause the spirit, 
is supposed to arise from this relationship between the father and the son. Mm -hmm. uh, he proceeds, at least in the Western Christianity, or Eastern Orthodox have their own views about this, but in, in Western Christianity, he proceeds from somehow the father and the son together. And, uh, and, and there's also an association of the spirit in particular with love. So somehow the love that the father and son have for each other is itself a third person. Right? Mm -hmm. So again, that's, that's the classic Augustinian uh, conception of it. Um, I, I gave a slightly different twist to it in the paper, my model. Um, and I suggested that we could just use, use logic here, the conjunction. So we could think of God qua knower, God is knower, mm -hmm. period. God qua known, period, simpliciter. And then God qua both knower and known, kind of combining the two aspects or qua features in a single being. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, um, and that's, that's my model for the spirit, right? So that's the novel part of the theory. And of course, not, not going to um, go to the, the stake over that one, right? But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, it's part, it's part of the model. I think it's, it's helpful because, you, you know, there's a sense in which you can see now that if that's true, then the spirit does. Uh, depend in a certain way on the father and the son, uh, and yet is still still God, right? Still is still God under uh, under a particular aspect. Okay, yeah. So I'm trying to like understand your view. Then here, Rob. So yeah. when we're looking like the distinction between like the father, the son, and the spirit is like yeah. different relationships between like different relations between God. Like how exactly is that working here in your model? Yeah, good. So I mean, maybe it would be helpful to think about actual people for a minute right? yeah okay yeah that'd be great. so you know we could think of we could think of biden as president biden as father let's say right mm -hmm. uh those are two qua objects right both of them founded on joe biden right um yeah. and uh and, you know there's certain things that would be true of biden as father that aren't true as biden as as president right mm -hmm. i mean he doesn't really have a son as president he has mm -hmm. the son as as uh, father, right? And yeah. conversely, he doesn't veto bills as father, <laughs> but as mm -hmm. president, right? Yeah. So, so we can make these kinds of distinctions. Um, now, interestingly enough, in the case of of a of a conscious being like Joe Biden, he mm -hmm. can actually act in these different ways, right? So he can sort yeah. of intentionally act as father in a particular setting, mm -hmm. right? And he might tell tell Hunter at some point, okay, I'm speaking to you now as your father, right? Yeah. Or in another context, he might say, no, I'm not speaking to you as the president, right? Yeah. And those would be obviously two different kinds of actions, right? Two mm -hmm. different ways of working out that particular relationship. Yeah. So, so in a similar sort of way, I think these, you know, the the, uh, the fact that God is is essentially a knower and 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 essentially knows himself uh, itself, the divine essence knows itself. Uh, that gives rise to these two aspects or qua objects, qua no or qua known. Mm -hmm. And and these things can actually color, in a way, God's own self-consciousness. So yeah. you can sort of think of things or will certain things or do certain things qua father, right? And do other mm -hmm. things qua son. So it's already, it's, it's in other words, it's an intrinsic distinction even for God. It's not, it's not again, just a distinction for us. Uh, trying to apply our inadequate concepts to God, um, uh, but it's it's a real distinction within God Himself is the idea. Mm. Um, yeah. So I wonder then, like we talked a little bit at the beginning, um, Rob, about like how you're like on the verge of he different heresies. Like your biggest challenge is like escaping modalism. Um, yeah. So when you're talking about like the the Biden analogy of like, well, Biden's also like he's like he is like the president, but he's also like the father, and some things may be true of him as the president that aren't related, like maybe as a father, like how is this going to escape yeah. modalism? Cause it seems like to me, if we think about God as like the father and of the son um, in that sense, like, I don't know, we're getting pretty close to modalism. So like, how would you kind of escape that? You don't want modalism. Yeah. yeah good. Um, so the distinction I think has to do with something like this, um, that uh, the fact that there's a distinction between Biden qua father and Biden qua president mm -hmm. is itself um, depends on extrinsic facts and even, even maybe contingent facts, right? If Biden had okay, never become yeah. president or father, we wouldn't have even had these aspects, mm -hmm. right? Um, so similarly, God qua creator, let's say, or God qua, uh, you know, inspirer of David or something like that, uh, those, those aspects of God wouldn't count as divine persons because they're contingent and extrinsic involved mm -hmm. relations between God and something else. Yeah. Uh, where you have distinctions that are 
grounded in the very divine being, in the very nature of God as knower, lover, and so on. Uh, and they're necessary, and they're not they're not relative to our knowledge, but but actually color God's own self consciousness in some sense. Mm -hmm. Then I think we've avoided modalism, at least as I understand it. Modalism is really the view that that the distinction between the three persons is somehow creature relative, right? That God relates to the creation in three different ways, and therefore we project onto Him this, these three guises. But uh, but my my model is one where God would still be three persons, even if He'd not created anything at all. Right? It's purely intrinsic mm -hmm. to Him, and necessarily so. So I think that's enough. At least at least I hope that's enough to get it out of the modalist camp. Okay, so one of the things I wonder then um, is it seems like like with your model, like we can definitely preserve like a version of like a, a theism. Like we're not going to get anywhere close to like tri theism. Um, like what about the idea? Like how, would this threaten at all? Like a very strong version of divine simplicity. So you think in like in one sense, like maybe like God's the Father, God's the Son, God's the Spirit. Um, but if there's three persons. Like isn't there some distinction within God? Which if you want to hold like to a super strong version of divine simplicity, like you can't do that. So how would you say like your model kind of escapes that? Um, challenge with the yeah. distinction of persons. Right, right. Yeah. So, you know, again, I mentioned uh, this model that Mike Gray and I guess Jeff Bauer, um, Brower put together recently where um, there are three different properties or qualities or something that get added to mm -hmm. God that distinguish the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. That mm -hmm. I think would be incompatible with the strong doctrine of simplicity because mm -hmm. now we're adding additional accidents. So in addition to his, his nature, he's also got paternity, right? And 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 we can talk about God qua paternal, right? Um, so in my picture, you know, you, you, the only property, so to speak, that God doesn't even have but is, <laughs> is this the relational divine nature. But it's a binary relation, right? And by the very logic or metaphysics of a binary relation, there's a distinction between the object and the subject, right? Um, and in, in God's case, it's a very important distinction because, in fact, I think, um, you know, if you think about love, for instance, which is the essence of God, uh, love in, in, in the Christian sense is always an interpersonal relationship. It always mm -hmm. involves some kind of I-thou relationship, a distinctness between the lover and the beloved. And so for God to be love, essentially, right, there has to be in that very relation a distinction between God as a lover and God as beloved, that initial I thou sort of relationship. Now, of course, it's also true that the son loves the father, right? But then it's going to be God qua beloved, right? Loving hmm. God qua lover. So, yeah. so it's still there's that that aspect of the son that in his very definition, so to speak, he's beloved. Is going to distinguish him from the father who is in by definition you the subject uh, mm -hmm. of, of this relationship rather rather than the object so so that's that's the thought um that it, 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 it that it all follows from in a kind of logical way this one relational essence of god okay as opposed to adding on a bunch of other kinds of properties or relations in addition mm -hmm. to the essence itself and that, that's just Augustine's idea, really. I'm, I'm, that, that, I'm, that I'm stealing from, from St. Augustine. <laughs> well, if Augustine's up there and he's pretty mad, well, then that's tough. So I don't know. Um, so, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I'm not, yeah, I mean, you might not agree with, you know, I'm sure you wouldn't agree with all the details, or at least uh, none of these. I, I, yeah. I, I don't, I'm not foisting all that on him necessarily. Yeah. Well, I'm just trying to flesh this out. So would you say then, like, um, so if you say, like, God is just, like, fundamentally relational and, like, that relation, like, God being relation is identical to himself, like a traditional, like, classical theism, like, so if, say from, from saying that, like, God is relational, like, you're going to get all this other stuff that's going to flow with your model of the Trinity. Is that what you're trying to get at? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we get, um, so, you know, it, it's true that, you know, if, if we speak in terms of um, the logical relation of identity and distinctness, right, the kind of strict sense of identity, then, then the Godhead, God itself, and God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, each one of those will be distinct entities. So there's actually mm. four, four distinct things, right? Because we can say things about each one of the four that we can't necessarily say about the others. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, God is three personal. The Father is not three personal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Father is uh, God qua knower. The God is just God, right? So there are some things. So there are logical distinctions among the four. And so they are distinct. Uh, now, in the, in the paper... I, I try to introduce a notion of real distinction, 
which is yeah. which goes beyond merely logical distinction. And, and then I define it in such a way that uh, the three persons are really distinct from each other, but none of them is really distinct from from God. Okay. Now, of course, that can't be just distinctness simpliciter, right? Because um, if, it, if it were just non-identity, right, then then, you know, the fact that, um, well, logical identity is is transitive, right? Mm -hmm. So if if each of the three persons were strictly identical to God, logically mm -hmm. speaking, they'd have to be identical to each other. And so you wouldn't have three persons. So this real distinction is something over is stronger than merely distinction. It's, it, it's a yeah. further relation. And uh, and the thought is that if you have two qua objects uh, and uh, and they're they're not logically equivalent. So in the case of Biden, Biden qua father, God, and Biden qua president, those are not the same kind of qua object, right? If you have that, and the distinction between the two is, is some intrinsic fact about the base, that is about Biden, mm -hmm. pu purely intrinsic fact, then the two qua objects would be really distinct. So in the case mm -hmm. of Biden, they aren't really distinct because they depend on extrinsic facts about, about Biden. But in the mm -hmm. case of of God, they they are. Uh, okay. Now there are some there are some possible things that in humans that are might be like this that are really distinct. So, for instance, uh, me qua rational, and me qua sentient. Uh, those might actually be really distinct, because the distinction between because I'm essentially rational and sentient, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. the distinction between rational and sentient is built into human nature. It's intrinsic mm -hmm. to me. So those are really distinct, right? And um, but but they're also distinct from me, really distinct from me in this case, because um, me qua rational leaves a lot of me out, right? Yeah. And me qua sentient leaves a lot out, right? Whereas God qua known, it's just God again. There's God because God knows Himself perfectly. This is the crucial mm -hmm. thing, right? When God knows Himself, He knows Himself completely and perfectly, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's no distinction at all between God qua known and just, and, and God, well, no, no real distinction in my sense between God qua known and God. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have this idea then, like if God is relational, um, that's gonna require like a lover and the beloved, which is like the father and the son. And then just trying to like, I'm just trying to like get a start, hopefully for people listening, if they've never heard of this view, you can really like try to understand that it. it's um, just slowing things down is what I'm trying to do, uh, yeah. even though I talk really fast. Um, so yeah. then like, where does the spirit, where does the spirit come into this exactly again? Um, so right. we have like this idea of God's fundamentally relational. We have a lover right. and a love, father, son, like where, where does the spirit fit in? Right. Yeah. So, so, so there are these two persons, the father and the son, right? They have these two sort of complementary distinctions right one mm -hmm. the knower the lover the other beloved known right as a, as a definition um and of course and of course they they love each other um so the traditional notion is that that bond of love is somehow a third person mm -hmm. so then the question is how to mix how to work that out and and here is my suggestion that you think of a third person now as one who actually combines the two at once right and this can, you can make sense of this. So for instance, there might be a few cases in which Biden can act both qua father and qua uh, president, qua mm -hmm. father and president, right? So there are certain, maybe, maybe you know, the, we pass a law that says, if you're the president and you're a father of somebody, you could do X, Y, and Z, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then he could invoke that and he say, okay, now I'm acting not just as father and not just as, as president, but as father and president of you, Hunter, right? Yeah. Uh, and so that would be a new kind of qua object, right? And so in the mm -hmm. same way, if we have God qua knower and God qua known, there's the possibility of a third kind of thing, which is God qua knower and known, combining mm -hmm. the two into a single into a single qua aspect, so to speak, of God. And then what's interesting in the papers, I try to argue that that's, if that's it. <laughs> You're not going to get any more persons than just those three. Uh, because every other kind of qua object that you could invent is not, is either not going to be real distinct from these three persons, or it's uh, not, or it's not going to count as a, uh, as a. Well, I, I give a kind of detailed definition of what a hypostatic uh, a person would be in this case. So mm -hmm. anyway, that, that's the, that's the attempt. So for instance, suppose you said, well, what about God qua, you know, knower of the Pythagorean theorem or something like that, <laughs> right? I say, well, that's not going to be distinct from God qua knower of God because God knows everything in knowing Himself, 
right? Mm. And so that's not really a distinct person. That's just God the Father again, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, what about God, qua, um, beloved, or uh, no, lover, right? Um, well, I'm going to say, well, that that doesn't really count as a distinct person because, you know, either the Father or the Son or the Spirit, actually, any one of three of them could qualify under that description. Um, so, um, so therefore, that doesn't really pick out a unique uh, person. It's just a, a vague way or indeterminate way of referring to e each of the three persons at once. And so mm -hmm. I go through that. I go through a number of different options. I'm not sure if I covered all of them, all the possible options. But uh, the hope is if the model works, right, it should give us exactly three persons. That would be cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's super cool. And I, I was just thinking about it, like writing like notes as we're going. I'm like, wow, if this works, like this is super cool. Like here's a really like potent and possible like model to like explain the Trinity where we have like the lover um, and the beloved. And then from that relationship, we have like the spirit and we can preserve like a version of like divine simplicity. So it's a super yeah. cool model. Um, one thing I want to just like hammer down on as we, before we get into like, thinking about the incarnation is the idea of the qua like we talked a lot about like qua 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 yeah, yeah, um, yeah. what exactly are these like qua relations um and trying to understand things so yeah yeah well yeah so as i said i mean there's a lot to be said here it, it, it has a long history mm -hmm. um you find um um yeah, they're still talking about this sort of thing quite a lot uh Hos is the Latin word, uh, Greek word yeah. for, for as. <laughs> uh, qua is Latin and as, of course, is English. So, so it's been around for quite a long time. Um, the thought is that you can, um, you've, got, you've got this one entity, which is, let's call it the base, right? Mm -hmm. And this, this base has a number of different properties, maybe different proper accidents, as we say, or aspects to it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we can associate a new entity, the qua object, uh, with each of those distinct descriptions. So Biden, you know, human being, qua human being. We mm -hmm. can talk about Biden qua mammal, right? That's why he's yeah. warm blooded, right? Biden qua president, Biden qua, you know, resident of the White House. So all the different features he has, all of those will give rise to two qua objects. Now, um, you know, some of these are going to have um, more or less deep roots in reality, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some of them will just be extrinsic facts about Biden, some of them very contingent, um, but some of them might be rooted in his, his very nature. Right? Like yeah. I said, Biden qua rational, Biden qua sentient, Biden qua living. Maybe those are actually really importantly distinct things in, 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 in Biden. Um, now, of course, in God says he also has one nature, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We're not going to be able to say God qua nature one and God qua nature two. Yeah. That doesn't going to make any sense. But if the nature itself is relationial, right, that, that's the whole idea, then you can get a binary relation. And you can get mm -hmm. God qua subject of the relation, God qua object of the relation, and maybe God qua both at once, both subject and object. Uh, and that mm -hmm. would give you three three persons for the thought. Mm. Yeah, it's super helpful. So the way you block the idea of like having like gazillions of divine, divine persons is saying like, well, well, God's fundamentally relational. Like, it's not like you can just say, well, God also just is like powerful, um, and you can't like have a trinity from power and things like that. It's like looking at this idea right. of like relation. Like, this is gonna be sufficient to like explain it. Well, this is where the divine. This is where the divine simplicity actually helps. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I actually think that that getting three persons is actually it's very helpful to have divine simplicity because. Uh, otherwise, we would have to distinguish between God's loving himself and God's knowing himself. Mm -hmm. And now we get four persons or six or, you know, whatever. Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. as you said, if we and if we then distinguish between God as powerful, God having power over various things, then that would be another relation, generate more qua objects. So, you know, if we if we deviate from a very strict kind of divine simplicity, we're going to start getting persons all over the place. <laughs> it's going to be really hard to, <laughs> yeah. to keep it keep it limited to three. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's super helpful. Um, maybe at this point, then it might be helpful to look at like Christian theology. Um, so obviously, like one of the like big parts that we want to hold to as Christians is this idea of like the incarnation. So in some sense, in the person of Jesus, um, God, the Son, the second person of the Trinity becomes flesh in the person of Jesus and lives, dies, resurrects, um, things like this. So how, how can your view make sense of the incarnation? Like if like, how would you kind of like approach that topic? Um, yeah. yeah. So um, I did mention that in the paper. Um but it's really a big topic, and uh, I haven't. I, I, I won't say that I have got a model I'm completely satisfied with. Um, yeah. I'll just say what what the doctrine is. At least the mm -hmm. classic Chalcedonian, you know, Chalc Council of Chalcedon yeah. model, which is that um, 
the second person has two natures or is two natures, a divine nature and, and a human nature. That um, that the human that it's not the case that that the second person the Trinity was converted into being a human being, uh, so it's not like the, the divine nature somehow became human. Uh, it's rather that the human nature was assumed. It's the technical language that's used, mm -hmm. elevated and sort of attached to the second person of the Trinity in such a way that the second person now is a second is a human as well as as divine simultaneously. So that's roughly the Chalcedonian, the limits of the Chalcedonian doctrine. And I don't really, in the paper, have much to say about how that's supposed to work. <laughs> I mean, it's a bit mysterious, actually, what it means to take this human nature sort of attached to the second person. Um, I mean, I think, I think it would be um, difficult, perhaps, to have an incarnation without the Trinity at all. Mm -hmm. Because then you'd have to attach the human nature to the divine nature. And I mean, one of the basic principles of, of the strong doctrine of divine simplicity is that is that the divine nature can't be combined with anything else. It's, it's mm -hmm. sort of yeah. it's not only does it not have parts, it can't be it can't even be, be part of something bigger. It's sort of isolated by itself. But but I'm not sure that that applies to the three persons. It's not, it's not so obvious to me that they couldn't be. Uh, parts of something larger in some sense. And so maybe that leaves room for the second person to become part of this larger entity, which is the human and divine uh, person. Um, the only thing that I really thought about a little bit was, uh, does my model say anything about which of the persons would, would be able to become incarnate? Because mm, um, yeah. that's an interesting question. And actually, here's, I, I, I don't know if Augustine ever mentions it, but Thomas Aquinas discusses it, he discusses most things. And he, he thought that any of the three persons could have become incarnate as a human being. Mm -hmm. um, although I think he does say that it's more fitting, as I recall, or more appropriate for the second person to be uh, incarnate. So anyway, I was, I was thinking, I was suggesting in the paper anyway, that there, we might be able to say something stronger. We might be able to say that only the second person really could become incarnate. Because, um, again, it's not, it's not that the divine nature in its very being, right, becomes united with, with the human nature of Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually unaffected by the incarnation, according to, the, according to uh, Thomas and, and the other people who believe in strong, strong simplicity. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's the human nature that's transformed by being united with God. And the divine nature isn't changed at all in the process. Um, but but the thought is that since this that's the case, then it really wouldn't make any sense for God qua knower to be incarnate because there's nothing from the subject side here that would that would link it to the incarnation. Whereas mm -hmm. if God wills that the that 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 Jesus be man and God, then you might think that it's God qua known that is going to be incarnate because it's going to be God as He knows Himself to be since he has willed the incarnation, right? Uh, the, so, now, so now he knows that the human nature of Jesus is united with himself, but it's qua known that he knows that, right? It's qua <laughs> known that that, that that attachment has happened. And the, if that's right, then, then it would make sense that it would be the son in particular, there would be the one who's united with human nature in order to be, make the incarnation happen. Mm. Yeah, super helpful and something I need to think a lot about because it's definitely, um... To get my mind around, I definitely challenge. So, with your model of the Trinity, then would you say like there's one center of conscious? Like, how do you get into like obviously like the social the, the typical yeah. idea is like the social Trinitarians start with the threeness and try to get oneness and vice versa. Latins oneness and threeness. Like, um, where right. would you be with your model and like trying to understand like how many like centers of consciousness there would be within like God? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with the language of center of con consciousness. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm sort of inclined to say zero. <laughs> uh, that is, uh, it's just not clear to me that that makes sense in God's case. Mm -hmm. um, but it does seem, but I think I could say that there's a sense in which there's three, I don't know, modes of consciousness or three mm -hmm. ways God has of thinking of himself, both, you know, as knower, as known, and as both, all, all three of those. So, um, so I do think it, Another sort of metaphor I like to use is that it, it colors God's consciousness. These 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 three distinctions of person personhood. Mm. Uh, it's not it's again not, not just sort of extrinsically imposed upon God by us, but but it but it's an intrinsic fact about the way God knows Himself. I think. Yeah. Thanks.
Yeah, that's helpful. I'm just trying to figure out and like why I asked that question is trying to think about. So we have this idea like under your model, like um, what makes Jesus divine in that sense of trying to understand like is it like the, like the divine center of like self consciousness? Is this, like you talked about this mm -hmm. idea that, like um, the human nature of Jesus is attached to the set like to, to the second person, the Trinity, the Son. Yeah. Um, but then I wonder like okay, well, what about um, him being attached makes him divine? Because is it like the divine consciousness? But if there's the second person. If we want to avoid that language, like, what are we, what are we getting here? Um, cause there's gotta be something there. And I'm just trying to understand like what that would be. Yeah. That's hard. Those are hard questions. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I expected I, you to have every single answer. <laughs> question, don't you, you know, you're I mean, I'll say to... what I don't like much. So I know, um, Bill Craig's a friend of mine, but he, he's got a model here where it strikes me that he ends up with a kind of hybrid Jesus where he's, his consciousness sort of partly human, partly divine or something like that, or it's mm -hmm. it's human on the surface. And then there's these depths, which sort of opens up into the divine or something like that. Yeah. And I, I feel uncomfortable with that because that sounds to me like it's a bit too much of a, uh, what we might call a, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, the, the, there's a whole heresy about this, um, monoph monophysitism. Uh, so in other mm -hmm. words, the idea that that what Jesus really has is a kind of single nature that's somehow a fusion of the divine and human. And mm -hmm. I don't want that, right? Uh, I think that I'm, I'm orthodox in a sense. I want, I want it to be Chalcedonian. So there's two distinct mm -hmm. natures that are not confused, as the as the Athanasian Creed puts it. Yeah. Um, so, um, so what does that mean here, right? I mean, you're like, what was it like to be Jesus? I guess is the question you're asking, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's a really tough one. I think, you know, that that he had a fully human life, right? Mm. Um, so there was a human consciousness, which was human. Now, you know, sinless and elevated in lots of ways. Uh, had the beatific vision all the time and so on. But still, it was, it was human, right? Mm -hmm. um, but of course, as second person Trinity, also had the divine consciousness and the divine mind. Yeah. And you know, what then is the relationship between the two? Well, the same person. <laughs> uh, yeah. And and that I mean, I'm sure that 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 definitely makes some difference from God's point of view, right? I mean, it means that it would be really inappropriate for Jesus to sin, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. So God is not going to will that Jesus sin because that wouldn't make any sense, right? And, and similarly, you might think that it, um, you know, given that God in thinking about Jesus is thinking, this is my, uh, this is me, right? the second person anyway, uh, that that does change somewhat the ethical and moral dimensions of it, right? Mm -hmm. So that it really is a kind of sacrifice of God himself when he dies, right? As opposed to just, I'm going to make this person die for everyone else. Right? Um, so it, it makes some differences there. But, you know, what, what? I don't think I can go any further than that, actually. Yeah. So there's still a mystery there. There's, I mean, in yeah. any case, in all all across it, there's a mystery, right? We we can't really expect to plumb the depths of it. Um, and I don't really have. I mean, it would be nice to have a model, right? Like I did for the Trinity, mm -hmm. but I don't really have one yet. Yeah, maybe it'll come upon you one day. But yeah, this maybe. has been super good, um, super helpful. Anything else yeah. that you want to talk about with regards to, like the Trinity, the Incarnation, that you might think might be relevant before we wrap up here? Yeah, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to say. Um, I, th I think we covered uh, quite, quite a bit of ground. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, you mentioned social Trinitarianism. Um, in some versions, right, it seems to me that that does come awfully close to kind of tritheism. Because mm -hmm. if you have, if you, if you do suppose that there is a divine nature, right, and then it is somehow shared by these three things, right? So each yeah. of them has it. Then that's three gods, right? <laughs> I mean, that's exactly, you know, we, we, we both, in a sense, have human nature, right? And yet mm -hmm. uh, there's two human beings here. So, um, so yeah, I think, I think it, it's helpful, really, to be able to um, uh, say that there's, there's no having. Um, okay, one more thing I might mention. I just discovered this recently. I was reading uh, Thomas on the unity of God. Mm -hmm. And and there he says something really interesting. This is in the Summa Theologia. It's part one. I forget exactly which question. Um, somewhere in there. Anyway, he he makes this point that when when we say that God is one, we're not applying. He says the the cardinal number one to God. Mm -hmm. We're not we're not sort of counting how many gods there are. We're just saying that God is indivisible. That, that's his way of putting it. Um, and so 
you know, that's, I think, helpful in a way, right? Because if, um, uh, you know, if, if God were one in a, in a kind of counting sense, right, there'd be this one particular that would sort of have the divine nature and, and then that would really exclude the possibility of there being three anything, right? Uh, but mm -hmm. the fact that really the divine nature in itself isn't really countable, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's just, an, it's just, it's just, it is, right? Uh, indivisibly. That opens up the possibility in a way of, of a kind of threeness there as well. I really like that, um, what Thomas said there that you brought up. I think, I think it's super helpful for this because I think sometimes, especially like when you get to the first part of just the idea of like, well, is the Trinity, like, can you even like understand it? Like, is it even like logically coherent? We have this idea, like you hear yeah. it says, like, well, we have one God and boom, three persons and done, problem solved. Like, there's nothing we can do right. about the Trinity, like game over. Right. Um, but like right. what Aquinas is exactly. saying here, like that the Trinity is in some sense, like indivisible. Well, that's really helpful because I think that, or sorry, God is indivisible. Like, cause it, it opens that door, as you said, um, I think yeah. that's, I'm really glad you brought that up. Cause it's definitely something yeah. um, helpful to think about and opens the door for a Trinity. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Rob. I really appreciate this conversation. It's been super fun to like um, dive super deep into this. So yeah, thank you so much for coming on and any, anything you can say with regards to like how people can like follow your work or things like that. Yeah. I mean, I've got the website, Rob, Rob uh, You can look at that. Um, Got a new book coming out in a couple of months on uh, on the Thomas Aquinas's philosophy of nature, mm. and this is some recent work I've been doing on on scholastic philosophy and modern modern science, quantum quantum science in particular. So folks might be interested, interested in that as well. Huh? Yeah, that sounds super cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Rob. Really appreciate it. I encourage you to check everyone to check out his website. Um, you can look up a lot, Rob Coons. And if you're new here, I always encourage you to subscribe, leave a like, all that fun stuff. Um, if you got content, you can become a patron at patreon.com. So you're here in apologetics. No new patrons, I think, since the last time we did this, but you can always support and do that. And we'd be super grateful. But yeah, thank you so much, Rob, for coming on. And yeah, God bless. We'll see you next time. Thank you. My pleasure.